Welcome to this morning's session of Eco-Socialism 2021, Stop the War Drive, AUKUS and the Campaign Against China. First, I want to acknowledge we are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, whose sovereignty was never ceded. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Across the globe, we've seen an escalation of rhetoric against China and anti-Asian racism. Australia has been complicit with the US in a major military buildup against China, including the new and very dangerous AUKUS nuclear sub-alliance. What are the reasons for this dangerous level of anti-China propaganda? This workshop will start to tease this out. We will hear from two speakers and authors, first David Brophy, then Peter Boyle. Then we'll host some questions and comments and discussion from you all. Well, David Brophy is a historian and senior lecturer in modern Chinese history, author of China Panic, Australia's Alternative to Paranoia and Pandering, and Uyghur Nation, Reform and Revolution on the Russian-China Frontier. He's been campaigning for the human rights for the Uyghurs and the right to autonomy for the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region since 2009. He's also an activist in the National Tertiary Education Union and in the refugee rights movement. David Brophy is a key contributor in Australia to the campaign against anti-Chinese racism and a long-term socialist. He's written for Green Left, The Guardian, The Monthly, The Australia Book Review, The China Story, The Sydney Morning Herald, and The Conversation. David will speak for 20 minutes and then we'll hear from Peter Boyle, who is a long-term activist and member of the Socialist Alliance National Executive. He's been a socialist and an anti-racist activist since early 1970. He radicalised around war, race and class issues after migrating to Australia from Malaysia. He has long involvement in the Aboriginal rights movement and has been involved in campaigns of international solidarity, workers' rights, democratic rights and defence of the environment. He has deep connections with the solidarity movement in Malaysia and is a key organiser in the solidarity movement with Rojava, the Kurdish-led feminist revolution on the Syrian border. He was one of the founding national conveners of Socialist Alliance and served a couple of terms in that role. Peter is co-author of the recent pamphlet Behind the Cold War on China and a regular and thoroughly engaging contributor to Green Left. Peter will speak after David. I'm coming to you from uh, stolen Bidjigal land in, uh, in Sydney and I want to acknowledge and pay respects to the uh, elders of that community. Uh, thanks, Rachel, for the introduction. Thank you to Green Left and Socialist Alliance for the invitation to, to talk today. Now, there's never a bad time, um, I think, to build pro-peace, anti-war sentiment, but the, uh, the last couple of months in particular have shown the urgency there is to that task now in, in Australia. It's shown that uh, in a couple of ways. Now, I know that we're here to talk about China, but I, I just want to begin by saying a few words about the fallout from Afghanistan and the very conspicuous efforts I see to avoid Australians drawing any uh, lessons from that conflict. Um, even the idea that the decision to go to war there was contested uh, has been obscured in the discussion. Uh, we've heard instead from the architects of the war, ABC interviewed people like Paul Wolfowitz, John Howard, uh, and the same pundits who provided ideological justifications for the war from its beginning. Uh, that US airstrikes could avoid civilian casualties, that there was a winning formula that we were close to hitting uh, if we just gave it more troops uh, and more time. And um, we very quickly flipped back to a simplistic pre-war depiction of Afghanistan as just some sort of terrorist hellhole uh, without asking what I think is the obvious question. Uh, that is, if the Taliban are, are bad guys, um, true enough, how bad must the occupation regime have been? How despised among ordinary Afghans that the Taliban were able to revive and then waltz into Kabul when uh, Western troops left? And we've seen a series of talking points that, that take it as a given the West's right to do what it did in Afghanistan and, and assume the likelihood that we might do the same again. Uh, for example, you might, you might have heard this worry, for example, that we don't, if we don't get people who collaborated with uh, the Australians out, then, then people might not trust us again in a similar situation in the future. And when I heard this, I, I kept wanting to ask, where do people have in mind? Where, where are we planning to do this uh, again? Um, clearly, the point here has to be that there must never be similar situations in the future. 
the age of, of Western governments intervening in, in poor defenseless countries like Afghanistan to reshape their politics to our liking has to come to uh, an end. And the second point, of course, that highlights the need to build and mobilize anti-war sentiment uh, today is, of course, the escalation of tensions uh, with China. And there's a link here because we have to remember that the withdrawal from Afghanistan has been justified by the need to focus energy on, on China. Um, and the fact that Joe Biden was willing to incur the considerable criticism that he did um, in the course of that withdrawal shows the importance um, that he attributes to that, uh, that focus. Um, in my book, China Panic, which Rachel mentioned, I, um, I describe what I see as a concerted campaign since 2017 to pull, out, pull Australia out of its hedging stance towards China and give it a leading role in catalyzing a US-led containment strategy towards that country. Uh, now that campaign initially centered on exaggerated warnings of domestic political interference, a, a depiction of China as white anting Australian democracy. This, uh, this rhetoric was pioneered by the security agencies, but it was, it was not limited uh, to them. Uh, people often complain these days about, about DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade being sidelined by voices like uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, well, I just want to quote to you the head of DFAT in 2020 discussing the threat that China poses uh, to, to Australia. Uh, she said that the institutions we take for granted, our parliament, our democracy, our legal system, our freedom of speech and association, they really are at stake now. Uh, China was ostensibly coming to take away all of these, all of these good things. Um, people talk about China's wolf warrior diplomats um, and their very unmeasured tone. Um, I think it's worth us asking, you know, just how measured have Australian diplomats been? Um, China, of course, as a consequence of all this is replacing terrorism as justification for an ongoing attack on civil liberties, um, the, um, which we've already seen um, in the form of new foreign interference legislation. Uh, too much of that is never enough uh, for ASIO. Uh, which has just tabled its annual report, uh, citing the activities of foreign spies. Uh, Mike Burgess says that he wants uh, less restrictions on ASIO's use of tracking devices, uh, the ability uh, to force wider categories of people to submit to, uh, to interviews, uh, and so on. Now, this climate of suspicion, of course, quickly dredged up racist tropes of Chinese Australians as a fifth column for Beijing. Um, which then blended uh, with more direct racist attacks with the arrival of COVID. Uh, and the statistics show the deteriorating situation really, um, really starkly, just to, to give you a couple um, of them. There was a report from a, um, an organization called the Scanlon Foundation, Mapping Social Cohesion is the title of the report 2020. Um, it found that almost half of Australians, 47%, um, say that they have negative views towards the Chinese Australian uh, community. Um, on the converse, uh, on the, the receiving end, uh, a Lowy Institute poll uh, issued in 2021, March this year, um, <clears throat> found that in the preceding 12 months, 31% of Chinese Australians had suffered racial abuse and 18%, almost one in five, had been physically threatened uh, or attacked because of their Chinese heritage. Um, now, of course, the discussion has taken on an increasingly militaristic tone of late, uh, the drums of war, and uh, of course, the announcement uh, of AUKUS. Uh, confronting and reversing this slide towards confrontation in East Asia, I think has to be the priority for all uh, anti-war activists and really anyone who has a hope uh, for a better world uh, in Australia today. Uh, we need to set that campaign within an alternative framing uh, of the whole situation, not something different to the dominant one of an innocent Australia being bullied by China. Um, not, I think, to replace that with an image of an innocent China being bullied by uh, the West, but to recognize here the dynamics of geopolitical rivalry between the US uh, and China, with America's desire to uphold a fragile hegemony in Asia being called into question by China's economic, political, uh, and military rise in the region. Now, there's no threat to Australia in this, in any conventional sense. Uh, there is, though, the possibility that a, a diminished U.S. role in the region will diminish America's interest in its relationship to uh, Australia. And that calls into question a basic principle of Australian foreign policy ever since colonization, an alliance with an imperial hegemon. Uh, 
uh, in Asia. Not, uh, I would insist, as a defensive measure, but as a method as a method of shaping Asian politics uh, in accordance with the elite interests uh, that are sold to us here as the uh, the national interest. Uh, and the sustainability of that policy is now in question. And, and I think this is what's provoking the hawkish lurch in, uh, in Canberra. Australia has actively sought to stiffen uh, American resolve and offer strategies and talking points for taking on China, uh, as well as seeking ways to bind the two nations uh, militarily. Uh, and that's what we see in AUKUS. This was not something imposed on Australia, but something that uh, Canberra actively uh, lobbied for. Um, as one American official put it um, at the time of the announcement, this is, quote, a fundamental decision that binds decisively Australia to the United States and Great Britain uh, for generations. Now, the risks here are quite obvious, uh, putting Australia on the front lines of the Cold War that could go hot uh, and potentially escalate to, to nuclear level, um, all for a cause that no one should be willing to, to die for, the maintenance of a post-World War II American dominance uh, in Asia, and alongside that, Australia's ability to dominate its region in similar fashion uh, with part, in partnership with the, um, with the US. Um, well, alongside the, the, the risks, I want to talk about the opportunity that AUKUS uh, presents us with. There have always been divisions um, within the Australian foreign policy establishment um, in this debate, largely centered on strategic questions. The, uh, primarily the, the question of the long-term viability of uh, a strategy of reliance on the, um, on the US. And that sense of Australia um, gambling uh, on um, US staying power has certainly been heightened by AUKUS. From the point of view of uh, military procurement, uh, it's been seen as a questionable move. Um, even extreme hawks like Peter Hatcher and Greg Sheridan have both come out against it uh, on that basis. And when you've lost people like that, uh, it's a bad sign. Um, what we've also seen is AUKUS revive sections of the progressive movement in Australia. Um, Australia's bid for membership in the club of nuclear powered militaries has activated uh, environmental and anti-nuclear campaigners. Um, now, I've been talking quite a lot about China recently, but in fact, the AUKUS discussions that I've been involved in have been um, quite refreshing because they haven't been centered on China. They've been centered on Australia, uh, Australian policy, Australian militarism. Um, and I think that's, um, that's a healthy development. Now, um, well, I think, in fact, the nuclear submarines are a bit of a sideshow in relation to more concrete elements of AUKUS, uh, like uh, increased presence of American troops on Australian soil uh, and so on. The, the shift from conventional to nuclear submarines has made it much more obvious to people that Australia's military posture is a fundamentally aggressive one, um, that it is designing a military to fight uh, a war against China alongside uh, the US on China's doorstep. Now, people like Hugh White have been saying this for, for 20 years, um, essentially, um, but it's now a point that um, we're in a position to, to drive home. Uh, the regional reaction, of course, has also exposed the myth that all of, us, all of Asia is cheering on a uh, resurgent um, Anglophone militarism. Uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, both deeply concerned. Uh, certain Pacific nations have criticized it uh, very strongly. Uh, Foreign Minister of South Korea, um, a country that many imagine to be firmly in the US camp, has described AUKUS as reflecting a, quote, old style Cold War mentality. Uh, we see AUKUS having the effect of kicking opposition into gear uh, elsewhere uh, around the world. So a good example of this was the, uh, the UK Labour Conference, uh, where an emergency motion from the floor received um, more than 70% of support um, of the conference opposing uh, AUKUS. And we need to be working to ensure that this announcement has uh, the same kind of effect here in, uh, here in Australia. Now, of course, we need to take advantage of these various ruptures uh, in the elite debate and, and international diplomacy without collapsing our position into one or other side of this uh, elite foreign policy debate here in, in, in Australia. Um, our position is clearly not to advocate a, a return to the, um, the corporate-led uh, engagement paradigm that guided uh, Australian policy towards China in the 1990s and, 
uh, 2000s, were such a return even uh, possible, which I'm, uh, I'm skeptical of. For all the hyperbole, the standoff with China has re re revealed certain truths about Australia. It's, it's true that business elites have been too cozy with China at times. Uh, the left has said this um, and needs to keep saying this. We have a critique of the profit-driven free trade approach to China. Uh, the benefits of that have been far from equally distributed. Um, and those who advocate for it often do slip into apologetics uh, for human rights abuses in, uh, in China. Uh, we also have to be conscious of the pitfalls of uh, this slogan of an independent foreign policy. Now, of course, when people raise this, you know, often that they simply have in mind Australia sort of keeping out of this conflict, um, not picking sides. And I, I think that's the right instinct. You know, Australia should be independent in that, uh, in that sense. But as a, as a term within the foreign policy debate, this independent foreign policy tends to have a more specific meaning. Um, essentially going it alone, but doing roughly what Australia does now, just without US support. So while dovish in relation to China, this is usually in fact a recipe for a more militaristic uh, Australia because this policy will require increased military spending. Now, how is that that increase in military spending to be justified? Well, I think it's almost inevitable that it will be justified by continuing to position China as, uh, as the bogeyman. Uh, and as well as that, you know, we need to be conscious that people in that camp tend to be more open than the, the hawks that, to the idea of Australia acquiring nuclear weapons, um, which of course, uh, AUKUS is um, itself a, a step um, uh, towards. So to avoid this trap, you know, we need to insist on a more transformative vision, uh, an internationalist commitment to ending the dynamics of, of interstate competition. The, um, the debate these days often sits at the level of who's to blame, you know, did Australia trigger this, is China bullying Australia and so on. And we, you know, we need to have things to say about those questions. But what we really need to highlight is the systemic nature of this rivalry and the need therefore to confront it uh, at the systemic uh, level. Now I say all this and it's, it's not gonna be easy. We have to acknowledge uh, to resist the pressure that we're likely to face uh, as the international situation deteriorates. We know that there are deep reserves of racist hostility uh, towards China uh, that can and will be drawn on to, to sustain this campaign. Um, so clearly we need to link anti-war campaigning to, to anti-racist work. Uh, as we emerge from COVID, we need to be highlighting the alternatives um, that we could be um, putting to social resources to, um, um, the alternatives to endless increases in uh, military spending. Crucially, I think we need to make the point that the, the high-minded justifications that will be advanced for conflict uh, with China, human rights, uh, and so on, cannot simply cannot be advanced by the methods that our politicians are, uh, are advocating. The repression in Xinjiang is not made up. It's very serious. Uh, it's ongoing. Uh, the events in Hong Kong represent a setback for the cause of democracy globally. Um, Taiwan is in a precarious position now. Uh, these are all things we need to be conscious of uh, and find ways to uh, respond to. But none of these things justify the current antagonistic posture uh, that Australia has taken. That posture is doing nothing to provoke um, uh, uh, values of anti-racism, opposition to Islamophobia. Uh, it's not taking us towards a world free from state repression and, and bullying diplomacy. Uh, quite the opposite, in fact. We, we know that confrontation with China will increase the West's willingness to turn a blind eye to those things when it's in its uh, interest to do so. Um, you know, we can see that very clearly um, in the way that um, Australia is closing up to countries like uh, Modi's India. Um, you just can't piggyback good things like human rights on a strategy to uphold Western military dominance in Asia. We all want Australia to be a country that can make a meaningful contribution to uh, human well-being around the world, uh, including uh, in China, but the starting point for that has to be a rejection of the current drive towards confrontation. Um, finally, we need to find allies among young Australians who've in most cases, not really seen what a serious anti-war movement uh, looks like. Um, but polls show that young Australians in particular are on, on our side uh, on this issue. Uh, young Australians are much more skeptical of ANZUS, um, while a large majority of older Australians uh, believe that the US will come to Australia's defense uh, 
Um, only around 60% um, of young Australians believe this, while 73% of people, I'm getting this from the most recent Lowy poll, um, while 73% of people above 60 uh, see China as more of a security threat uh, than an economic partner, only a minority, 45% of 18 to 29 year olds uh, see things that way. Um, and the 2020 poll, which was the last time this question was asked, shows that 70% of young Australians oppose the idea of supporting US military action in Asia. Um, so we need to get to these people uh, before the, uh, the war hawks do. Uh, what we certainly can't do uh, is trust our politicians to, uh, to see the light uh, and pull out of this deadly game of chicken uh, with China. Uh, I'll leave my, my remarks there. Thank you. And I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, David. Very informative. Okay, we'll take it over to Peter Boyle. Hello, everybody. Um, um, I'm speaking to you from the land of Gadigal Wangal people, uh, and uh, I pay my respects to elders and warriors past and present. Um, I came to Australia as a 17 year old in the early 1970s from an island in Malaysia that was acquired by the British East India Company as a pit stop for its ships that were running opium to China in the, in, in, in the uh, 19th century. Um, and, and, and therefore I've, got, I've always had a great interest in China. And I think in, in my political radicalization, I have to admit that um, in the beginning, uh, the idea of the East rising uh, provided a lot of inspiration and I think it, you know, as I tried to understand the world, I, well, I read Mao's little red book at the same time as I, I, I started to read, to read Marx. But of course, you know, where you start can't be where you end. And I think, uh, I, I hope that, um, you know, the views that I put forward here, I think reflect uh, a much more, um, I guess, balanced and informed view of, of China's role today. Well, first of all, I, I'm going to focus my presentation on 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 the uh, on the AUKUS rather than uh, a great uh, discussion about the character of China. Though I'm happy to take up questions in discussion, because for the Socialist Alliance, AUKUS represents a very dangerous escalation uh, of the United States-led confrontation with China, and we are committed to building urgently the broadest possible campaign, mass campaign, to try and break what we see as an imperialist war alliance, along with ANZUS, other military agreements with the US, and also to removing all US military bases from Australian soil. AUKUS is further implicating Australia in a massive US-led push to contain China. And this policy is not just about militarily encircling China. And China is militarily encircled by US and allied uh, forces. It is driven by a determination to block or at least slow down China's economic development. Now, Western and multinational corporations have been happy enough to subcontract much of their lower value manufacturing to China over the last few decades, particularly the most dirty polluting activity. Indeed, you could see that this was critical to capitalism overcoming its own global stagflation crisis in the late 1970s through a program of relentless cost cutting that is now known as the capitalist neoliberal offensive. And this, this, this rapidly accelerated a process of capitalist development in China. But now these same imperialist powers, having taken advantage of that process, don't want China to become a competitor, especially in the extremely high value, high tech areas of the global economy. While China still does not have an economy that is as developed as much as the rich imperialist countries, China now certainly ranks alongside the more, the more industrialized developing countries, including Mexico, Brazil, Turkey, et cetera. 
but it has the advantage of a far greater scale. And it is this scale that will inevitably result in China's GDP becoming the biggest in the world very soon, if it hasn't already. However, it has to be remembered that even so, China's per capita GDP remains only a fifth of that in Australia, as David Brophy has pointed out in his book. Furthermore, I think today the Chinese leadership is consciously trying to develop the areas of its economy where it, it can somehow match or even overtake uh, the imperialist powers economically. The Trump administration and now the Biden administration have made it very clear they want to block China's further development and AUKUS is part of this process. I think AUKUS is also a further development of the pivot to Asia, which began under the Obama regime, which brought along the stationing of permanent US Marine detachments in Darwin and the greater opening up Australian Naval and Air Force facilities to the US and the provocative regular joint naval actions that Australian uh, uh, warships uh, join in through the South China Sea. Before AUKUS, back in November 2020, Australia signed another agreement by the US to develop and test hypersonic cruise missile prototypes with long range uh, strike capabilities. And in March this year, relatively unnoticed, Dutton as uh, defense minister announced that this include, could include Australia acquiring its own intermediate missiles, which could hit targets in China. So it's absolutely no surprise that China wants to break out of this encirclement. The Morrison government's cancellation of the submarine deal with France also affirms Australia's alignment with a certain division between the main imperialist power blocks. Australia already had a special relationship with other Anglo-imperialist powers, which is expressed, for instance, in the Five Eyes Intelligence uh, Sharing Partnership, and also in its enthusiastic participations in the US-led invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. I think it is a mistake to reduce this, uh, if you like, special uh, relationship to common historic, cultural or linguistic uh, traditions. In fact, such arguments are a direct play to the entrenched racism, to entrench racism in Australia, which in itself is a consequence of its history as a European colonial settler state in the Asia Pacific. Australia began as a British colonial settler outpost and much of the initial capital investment came for Britain, but that has long shifted. And the story of this and the consequence politics, political developments, I think was well told by Humphrey McQueen in um, this book, New Britannia, which came out uh, in 1970, I think. And one of the strong arguments that Humphrey McQueen made in this book was echoed in David Brophy's uh, recent book, China Panic. And that is certainly from the 19th century, the Australian ruling class has never been forced to go along with imperial mil mil militarism. Rather, it has been one of its most enthusiastic supporters and often has even egged on the bigger imperialist powers. And that is being reflected again today, I think, uh, with AUKUS. There is a real material basis for this in the high interpenetration of foreign direct investment between Australian, US, Britain, and to a lesser degree, other imperialist powers. And some of this has been documented uh, by investigative reporters such as Michael West and michaelwest.com more recently. The capitalist material interest, of course, cloaks itself in a public political sales pitch, which seeks to build on a racialized fear and panic about the yellow and brown hordes that live in our regional neighborhood. Consequently, 
while the immediate economic and long-term strategic interests of the ruling class in Britain, US and Australia are not identical, they often overlap. In this context, I think uh, we also see AUKUS confirming uh, a sort of, a, if you like, second tier status of Europe uh, from the point of view of the US, uh, US, Australia and Britain. Uh, for whom they appear both as allies on one hand, but also as imperialist economic competitors. Now with the Australian government very keen to waste more than a hundred billion of taxpayers' money on nuclear power uh, submarines in this ongoing uh, confrontation with China, of course, it's no surprise that the US is quite happy that this money is now going to be pumped into its own industrial military complex rather than the French. In fact, I mean, even if you go with the projected deadlines uh, for these nuclear submarines, that, you know, whether they get delivered and when they get delivered so far in the future. But one thing is guaranteed is that uh, payments are going to be going that will uh, support uh, uh, the, the, the US uh, companies building these submarines. Now, one of the side effects of this could be that Australia may not secure a free trade agreement with the European Union, as well as lose more markets in China as well. But the way the Morrison government has rushed down the path of being prepared to both aggravate China and Europe, throwing everything in with the US, has began to provoke some criticisms uh, from within the ruling elite in this country, including from former prime ministers like Paul Keating and Malcolm Turnbull, who have been urging a slightly more cautious approach. And I think this reflects understandable nervousness in sections of the Australian capitalist class about this course of action. That having been said, our criticism of AUKUS as socialists or from the left is much more fundamental. We think Australians, Australia's foreign military policy is not a force for good in the world, and it never was. Australia is one of a small group of imperialist powers that systematically extracts huge amounts of wealth from 85% of the global population who live in the less developed countries. And these same imperialist countries also bear the greatest historical responsibility for the climate emergency. This unequal world authority has always been maintained through violence. Gunboat diplomacy has gone hand in hand with economic um, colonialism. And any less developed country, regardless of the political character of its government that tries to break free to challenge this hegemony and chart its own course is going to be met with sanctions, with interference, with military threats, and eventually possibly even with war. It has to be said also that this very same unequal world order underpins racism in the world today. Now, our Prime Minister Morrison says that AUKUS is motivated by shared values. Well, in a certain sense, he is right. These are the shared values that underpin the racist and violent dispossession of the First Nations people of this continent. They're the same shared values that send many young Australians to, to kill and die for imperialism all around the world, from Gallipoli to Korea, from Malaya, my country of birth, to Vietnam. They're the same shared values that underpin Australia's participation in the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, both of which were wars of terror that laid to waste the countries they were, they were carried out in and ironically created the basis for the emergence of more terrorism, more terrorist groups. And finally, I think we've got to bring in climate change because um, you know, this is the era we, 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 we are living in, the era of the climate emergency. And we simply cannot socially afford to waste billions and billions of dollars on more war machines to prop up a world order and to fuel this new Cold War with China.
this is neither morally acceptable nor materially or ecologically sustainable. Thanks.